Welcome to First Chapter Friday. Today I'm going to be reading The Land of Stories, The Wishing Spell by Chris Colfer. And you can see on the cover that this was a New York Times bestseller. This book was recommended by one of our sixth graders a couple of years ago when she was on the junior librarian team. And we've since purchased all the books in the series. They're really very magical and interesting. And even though the cover looks like they might be more appropriate for younger students, you can see that this is a pretty weighty book. And it's got a lot of complicated um, storylines and interesting vocabulary. So it's really appropriate for readers of all ages, uh, especially if you're reading with a family member. It's also by one of my favorite publishers, The Little Brown and Company. Um, you know, some people read books by their favorite author. I do that. Some people read books that are in a certain genre that they love, but publishers are also a really great way to find books that you love because they make choices about which books they want to publish. And if they choose the same kind of books you love, then it makes sense to keep up with them. This book also has a prologue at the beginning, and a prologue is not a first chapter exactly. It's a usually alluding to something else that's going to happen in the story later on or happen way back in the past that they want you to know about as you're starting the story and reading through. And then you will generally have more explanation about the prologue later in the story as you will in this one. I'm not going to start with the prologue even though it is really a very good um, hook for getting into the story. Another thing I like about this book is the dedication page. It has a quote from C.S. Lewis and it says, Someday, you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. And I just love that because I think sometimes we think that children's books, like fairy tales, uh, we've gotten too old for those. We don't need them anymore. But often they have really great information. And if you go back and read them as an older student or even an adult, you'll get a lot more out of it. Okay, so chapter one. And I should warn you, this is a long book, a long chapter. Chapter one, Once Upon a Time. Once upon a time, Mrs. Peters said to her sixth grade class, these are the most magical words our world has ever known and the gateway into the greatest stories ever told. They're an immediate calling to anyone who hears them, a calling into a world where everyone is welcome and anything can happen. Mice can become men, maids can become princesses, and they can teach valuable lessons in the process. Alex ba Bailey eagerly sat up straight in her seat. She usually enjoyed her teacher's lessons, but this was something especially close to her heart. Fairy tales are much more than silly bedtime stories, the teacher continued. The solution to almost every problem imaginable can be found in the outcome of a fairy tale. Fairy tales are life lessons disguised with colorful characters and situations. The Boy Who Cried Wolf teaches us the value of a good reputation and the power of honesty. Cinderella shows us the rewards of having a good heart. The Ugly Duckling teaches us the meaning of inner beauty. Alex's eyes were wide, and she nodded in agreement. She was a pretty girl with bright blue eyes and short strawberry blonde hair that was always kept neatly out of her face with a headband. The way the other students stared at their teacher as if the lesson being taught were in another language was something Mrs. Peters had never grown accustomed to. So Mrs. Peters would often direct entire lessons to the front row where Alex sat. Mrs. Peters was a tall, thin woman who always wore dresses that resembled old patterned sofas. Her hair was dark and curly and sat perfectly on the top of her head like a hat, and her students often thought it was. Through a pair of thick glasses, her eyes were permanently squinted from all the judgmental looks she had given her classes over the years. Sadly, these timeless tales are no longer relevant in our society, Mrs. Peters said. We have traded their brilliant teachings for small-minded entertainment like television and video games. Parents now let obnoxious cartoons and violent movies influence their children. The only exposure to the tales that some children acquire are versions that have been changed by film companies. Fairy tale adaptations are usually stripped of every moral and lesson the stories were originally intended to teach and replaced with singing and dancing forest animals. I recently read that films are being created depicting Cinderella as a struggling hip-hop singer and Sleeping Beauty as a warrior princess battling zombies. Awesome, a student behind Alex whispered to himself. Alex shook her head. Hearing this made her soul hurt. She tried to share her disapproval with her fellow classmates, but sadly, her concern was not reciprocated. I wonder if the world would be a different place if everyone knew these tales in the way the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen intended them to be known, Mrs. Peters said.
I wonder if people would learn from the Little Mermaid's heartbreak when she dies at the end of her real story. I wonder if there would be so many kidnappings if children were shown the true dangers that Little Red Riding Hood faced. I wonder if delinquents would be so inclined to misbehave if they knew about the consequences Goldilocks caused for herself with the three bears. There is so much to learn and prevent for our futures if we just open our eyes to past teachings. Perhaps if we embrace fairy tales as much as we could, it would be much easier to find our own happily ever afters. If Alex had her way, Mrs. Peters would be rewarded with thunderous applause after each lesson she gave. Unfortunately, all that followed her classes was a mutual sigh of relief among the students, thankful that they were over. Let's see how well you all know your fairy tales, the teacher said with a smile and began pacing the room. In Rumpelstiltskin, what did the young maiden's father tell the king that his daughter would spin hay into? Does anyone know? Mrs. Peters scanned the classroom like a shark looking for wounded fish. Only one student raised her hand. Yes, Miss Bailey, Mrs. Peters called. He claimed she could spin hay into gold, Alex said. Very good, Miss Bailey, Mrs. Peters said. If she had a favorite student, not that she would ever admit to having one, Alex would have been it. Alex was always eager to please. She was the definition of a bookworm. It didn't matter what time of day it was, before school, during school, after school, before bed, she was always reading. She had a thirst for knowledge, and because of it, Alex was usually the first person to answer Mrs. Peters' questions. She tried her best to impress her classmates with every chance she got, putting extra effort into each book report and class presentation she was assigned. However, this usually annoyed the other students, and Alex was often teased for it. She constantly heard other girls making fun of her behind her back. She usually spent much of her time alone, under a tree somewhere with an open library book. Although she would never tell anyone, Alex was so lonely that sometimes it hurt. Now, can anyone tell me what the compromise was that the maiden made with Rumpelstiltskin? Alex waited a moment before putting her hand up. She didn't want to seem like a total teacher's pet. Yes, Miss Bailey? In exchange for turning the hay into gold, the maiden promised to give Rumpelstiltskin her firstborn child when she became queen, Alex explained. That's a pretty steep deal, said a boy behind Alex. What a creepy old short man. Why would he want a baby anyway? A girl next to him asked. Obviously, he couldn't adopt with a name like Rumpelstiltskin, another student added. Did he eat the baby? Someone else asked nervously. Alex turned around to face her clueless peers. You're all missing the point of the story, Alex said. Rumpelstiltskin took advantage of the maiden because she was in need. The story is about the price of a bad negotiation. What are we willing to give up long-term in the future for something short-term in the present? Get it? If Mrs. Peters could change her facial expression, she would have looked very proud. Nicely put, Miss Bailey, she said. I must say, in all my years of teaching, I've rarely come across a pupil with as much in-depth knowledge as... A loud snore suddenly came from the back of the classroom. A boy in the back row was slouched over his desk and drooling from the corner of his mouth, very much asleep. Alex had a twin brother, and it was moments like these that made her wish she didn't. Mrs. Peters diverted her attention to him like a paper clip to a magnet. Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters asked. He continued to snore. Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters asked again, kneeling down close to him. He let out another enormous snore. A few of the students wondered how it was possible for such a loud noise to come out of him. Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters shouted in his ear. As if someone had lit a firework under his seat, Connor Bailey jumped back to life, almost knocking his desk over. Where am I? What happened? Connor asked in a panicked state of confusion. His eyes darted around the room while his brain tried to remember where he was. Like his sister, he also had bright blue eyes and strawberry blonde hair. His face was round and freckled and at the moment slightly smushed in to one side like a basset hound when it first wakes up from a nap. Alex couldn't have been more embarrassed by her brother. Besides sharing looks and a birth date, she and her brother couldn't have been more different. Connor may have had a lot of friends, but unlike his sister, he had trouble in school. Mostly trouble staying awake. I'm so glad you could rejoin us, Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters said sternly. Did you have a nice nap? Connor turned bright red. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Peters, he apologized, trying to be as genu genuine as possible. Sometimes when you talk for a long period of time, I doze off. No offense, I can't help it. You fall asleep in my class at least twice a week, Mrs. Peters reminded him. Well, you do talk a lot. Before he could stop himself from saying it, Connor knew it was the wrong thing to say. A few of the students had to bite their hands to stop from laughing. 
I recommend you stay awake while I teach, Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters threatened. Connor had never seen anyone squint their eyes so tight without shutting them before. Unless you know enough about fairy tales to teach this lesson yourself, she added. I probably do, Connor said. Once again, he spoke without thinking. I mean, I know a lot about this stuff, that's all. Oh, really? Mrs. Peters never backed down from a challenge, and every student's worst nightmare was that they'd be challenged by her. All right, Mr. Bailey, if you're so knowledgeable, answer this question. Connor gulped. In the original tale of Sleeping Beauty, how many years does the princess sleep before she is awoken by true love's first kiss? Mrs. Peters asked, studying his face. All eyes were on him, impatiently waiting for the slightest indication that he didn't know the answer. But fortunately for Connor, he did. One hundred, Connor answered. Sleeping Beauty slept for one hundred years. That's why the castle grounds were covered in vines and stuff, because the curse affected everyone in the kingdom and there was no one to garden. Mrs. Peters didn't know what to say. Or do you? She frowned down at him, immensely surprised. This was the first time he had ever been correct when she'd put him on the spot, and she certainly hadn't expected it. Try to stay conscious, Mr. Bailey. Lucky for you, I used my last detention slip this morning, but I can always request more, Mrs. Peters said, and promptly walked to the front of the classroom to continue her lesson. Connor sighed with relief, and the red drained from his face. His eyes met his sister's. Even she was surprised he had gotten the answer right. Alex hadn't expected Connor to remember any fairy tales. Now, class, I want you all to get out your literature books, turn to page 170, and read Little Red Riding Hood quietly to yourselves, Mrs. Peter instructed. The students did as they were told. Connor made himself as comfortable as possible at his desk and began reading. The story, the pictures, and the characters were all so familiar to him. And that's not really the end of the chapter, but it, it is quite a long chapter, as most of these are. So... It's a really good book. You can tell from the cover of the book that, uh, and the title that they're going to go into the story, Connor and Alex, his sister. And it's a little bit reminiscent of um, maybe the Magic Treehouse book series, but so much richer and deeper and really great reads for our fifth and sixth graders. So maybe you'll get a chance to put this on your reading list and pick it up next time you're in our school library.